space, which is right across my studio, and I'm going to talk from there. Welcome. We are on Facebook Live with Dr. Francesca. <laughs> yes. Dr. Francesca Ferrando, welcome. Uh, we're going to do this uh, as audio only. It is a type of a um, conversation, a meditation, a contemplation on where we are going into the future as women, as designers of our lives. And I'm so honored to have you here. So we will also record this as, as the podcast. Let me know when you're ready, Francesca. I'm ready. Okay, great. Wonderful. <laughs> All right. So here we go. Yes. Welcome, everyone. This is the Bliss Design Magazine podcast. And I have a beautiful guest with us today, an expert in post-human philosophy, Dr. Francesca Ferrando. I'm so honored to have you here, Francesca. Denise, I'm so honored to be part of this beautiful work that you are doing, spreading important wisdom and information through the internet. So thank you so much for welcoming to your world, to your virtual visions, to your space. Thank you. Uh, my expertise is in radical life extension, anti-aging and regenerative medicine. I am a mentor for high achieving future conscious women around the world. And I'm just truly, truly touched that you said yes to speak to me. I have a um, degree in biology and philosophy myself. I'm a huge philosophy buff. And when I heard you speak at the Assemblage in uh, New York, I felt this is it. This is the gal I want to talk to about the future femme. Well, I felt the same way when I saw some of your talks and your presence and your eyes. And I felt the same way. So I was truly honored to be able to actually engage in this important conversation and to envision together and to connect our visions. So yeah, it's very reciprocal. It's come from both sides. Wonderful. Fantastic. Well, Francesca, let's really have you tell us about what you're creating in the world. Um, tell us about your expertise, what you're doing in the world, and from there we'll take it into the whole field of the future of the woman. Yeah. So what I do in this point of my life is uh, philosophy. Uh, so I teach philosophy, I write philosophy, I think philosophy, I exist as a philosopher. What does that mean? That uh, I am aware that every microsecond of my life is writing in the big uh, book chapter that uh, in which we are together as a species. So I'm aware of our own agency in, in this uh, dimensional uh, manifestation. And um, so um, because of that, I want to connect with, uh, with more people to see what other people are seeing and to see if we want to see together uh, the future, because again, the future is not, uh, the future is again, the future is not tomorrow, the future on some level already happened. The future is here with us now. And, um, and we are creating, we are co-creating the future. Uh, it's a pluralistic uh, uh, connection, it's a plurilogue more than a dialogue. And in this plurilogue, I want to hear other voices and I want to hear my voice resonating with other voices, either voices and other voicing. Um, so the, uh, I do see the, the political, the creative, the artistic uh, uh, perspective of uh, being a philosopher, not just uh, working as a philosopher, but, but being, being existing as a philosopher. Philosopher come from uh, the word philosophy, ancient Greek. Some people uh, like to translate it as the love for wisdom, philos, love and Sophia, wisdom, but you can also re reverse it and you can also do the wisdom of love. Mm? I know that you, you are very much engaged with the, 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 the political uh, importance of love, and uh, you can think uh, of philosophy in that sense too. You just reverse the order and you do the love, Sophia, of um, wisdom or the wisdom of love. So I think that the wisdom of love applies to your work and I thank you for that. Oh, that's so beautiful. I do love to think that um, I'm trying to really uh, bring together a union of wisdom and love in, 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 in the way I do medicine, in the way I do mentorship, in the way I design uh, and um, as an artist. So I'm with you um, in full resonance. 
Wonderful. Well, um, I have been in the field of transhumanism for over two years now. I was introduced to this um, by Dr. Natasha Vita Moore and her amazing husband, um, Max Moore. And I know that you have spoken on panels with him. And so my expertise or my knowledge into um, in, in, in the area that you study is, is from the angle of transhumanism. But I know that you make a quite a distinction between transhumanism and posthumanism. And I'd love to dive into that and make it really relevant to women in the world. Why do we make that distinction? And what should we know about it as women creating, designing um, impact in the world? Yeah, so that's a beautiful question and it's very much related to my work. So thanks for asking that. So, uh, yeah, um, let's say that at the moment we could define this chapter of uh, our philosophical existence. So not only philosophy in the academic sense, but us as philosophers. And when I say us, I mean the people who ask why. I think that everyone is a philosopher. I don't think that you need a degree in philosophy to call yourself a philosopher. Uh, people in ancient Greek did not have a degree in philosophy to call themselves philosophers. I think that when you are very young and you stop uh, and you, you, you know, you, 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 there is like movement around, but you stop one second and you look at everything and things do not quite make sense. And you ask, why? Why am I here? What is this? And I think that's, that's philosophy. That's the philosopher in each of us. And then people find their own answers through religion or through the arts or through their own work or through their own families. Now people give meanings, but that moment of uh, complete potential, full potential, complete openness of the child that, open their eyes and finally ask why it could be when you're born or when you're a little older, depending on, on your own, uh, you know, on your own, on, a, on your own path. But I think that is the philosophical question. And, um, so everyone has this inside of them. And that's something for me important to underline. So in this chapter in which we are now as philosophers, I could define this chapter as post-human. And what I, what I mean by that, um, as you correctly said, um, there are different school of thoughts, different people, uh, different movements who are actually addressing this specific topic that we can call posthuman. That's why I like to think of posthuman as an umbrella term, mm? an umbrella term in which there are many different dynamics involved. Um, in, inside of this uh, umbrella term or um, connected more than inside, inside would be uh, exclusive. So let's say connected to this umbrella term, there are different schools of thoughts. We can think of transhumanism and posthumanism mostly because these are um, the two main, I would say, movement at the moment, but there are many others. There is anti-humanism, meta-humanism, new materialism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Also, within these uh, uh, movements, uh, these movements are not one but many. So again, transhumanism. We should also think of transhumanism. So there is a libertarian transhumanism, democratic transhumanism, extropianism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So definitely, and the same for posthumanism. There is critical posthumanism, cultural posthumanism, uh, philosophical posthumanism, etc. Now, I don't want to confuse everyone with all these terms, you know, throwing there like, you know, like stars in the sky. But yeah, we should think of the posthuman as, as, as the sky, you know, at night there are all these beautiful stars and it's exciting, it's happening. So what are all these people, um, what do have all these people in common? Well, all these people have in common the fact that uh, we all see the human as something that is evolving. Of course, you can go through Darwin, but not only. You can go through many spiritual traditions. You can go through uh, some specific uh, approaches to consciousness. So the idea, again, that the human is something that is evolving. So there is not uh, one defined, close way to define the human. Um, even in biology, since it's beautiful you study both biology and philosophy, but even in biology, it's very hard to define the human in a 100% comprehensive way. Um, everyone is somehow a little different DNA from each other. So even from a DNA level, it's hard to define what is human DNA. Um, so again, the human is something that we can think as a, as a, as a wave, something that is constantly more evolving mm, from a material perspective. And when I think material, I also think conscious. Mm? So matter is conscious, is agential, is, uh, is generative, regenerative, not something that's passive, as, you know, not, uh, not in that uh, dualistic way of matter separated from uh, the spirit. No? But on the other side, a matter that is alive or matter that is uh, dynamic, shifting, constantly evolving itself. So everyone agrees of these movements, at least, that the human is not something static, but it is something that is shifting, evolving, mutating, modifying itself, um, 
etc., etc. Now, how this happened, there are different answers. According to transhumanism, uh, we are, some, um, some of us um, are transhuman now, we are not posthuman yet, uh, and it's a transformation of the human, uh, the human who is aware of their own agency in, um, in directing uh, evolution. Mm? Uh, only human evolution, yes, for some, evolution in total, yes, for others. Uh, this is come from Julian Axley, who actually um, created the coin, the, the term transhumanism, uh, transhum transhumanizing was already a term found in other scholars but, and, and thinkers like Teilhard de Chardin, but transhumanism, that's uh, Julian Axley, 1956. And he actually said that humanity is at the stage where they should become the director of the biggest uh, business of all, the business of evolution. Some people get excited by his visionary view, some people not so much because they see a problem with anthropocentrism, which is the criticism that comes from posthumanism. Now, um, Natasha and Ma Max Moore, they are very, very interesting thinkers of the transhumanist movement. I engage constantly with them. Um, they are uh, friends and, and great thinkers. Although myself, although I'm in constant dialogue with the transhumanist uh, community, I am myself uh, locating the philosophical posthumanism area of all these discussion. What's happening there? Um, it happens that the human is uh, deconstructed first before moving on. So the different we both see the, the fact that the human is evolving, is mo modifying the whole concept of the human. But according to transhumanism, uh, the way to do it is through science and technology, and it's in a linear way. Mm? Transhumanism comes out of the Enlightenment with high emphasis on notions such as progress, such as reason. This is problematic for someone who come out of postmodernism, such as myself, uh, according to which, uh, how do you define progress? And this was a big uh, discussion after World War II, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Was the nuclear bomb something that could be considered a progress? So a lot of people said, no, that's not progress, that's regress. So anyway, progress is not something that we should just take for granted as a notion. And the same goes for reason. A lot of humans have been excluded from the notion of humanity exactly because of reason, because they were considered unreasonable with no reason. Women, for instance, eh? they were connected to feelings. Slaves, for instance, they were con connected to the irrational. So again, these notions of reason and, 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 uh, and um, for instance, progress are problematic notions. So in the philosophical discussion, the, the transhumanism uh, movement, transhumanist movement located itself in the Enlightenment. On the other side, posthumanism located itself in the postmodern approach. So the human is uh, deconstructed first. So it's um, the human is not seen as one, but as many, uh, deconstructed to, to class and gender and, uh, and religion and creed and, uh, and sexual orientation and you name it. Hmm? So there is all this deconstruction going on. Uh, and then again, also the time is not seen as linear. So the future is not tomorrow, it's already happening. So and it's already connected to the past. So we cannot forget the past in order to think uh, the present and the future. Mm hmm. It's a lot. Sorry, I yes, kind of no, that's went great. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, the difference, um, the, uh, the you know, the pull of uh, transhumanism uh, from the Enlightenment ideas. Um, this is the key. What I found really beautiful about your distinction uh, when it came to posthumanism and transhumanism is um, the difference between revealing humanity and upgrading humanity. I love that. I love that. Can, oh, yeah. Can you touch yeah. on that? Um, yeah, no, I love that. Uh, yeah, this is a uh, go straight to actually again the philosophical genealogy. Um, I love you bringing the notion of revealing because that's very connected to Heidegger and uh, to his notion of technology. So yes, the posthuman also engage with the notion of technology, embraces the notion of technology, but technology is not seen just in its technical outfits. What I mean by that? Technology is not just computers. Technology is not just phones. Technology is not just uh, electronic devices or drones or AI. It is all of that, yes, but it's much more than that. 
is, according to Heidegger, a way of revealing. In that sense, we can think of evolution as a form of technology. I call existential technologies, this other form of technology, technologies of the self, to go to Foucault. So definitely, uh, both post-humanists and transhumanists embrace the notion of technology, so there is no uh, a Luddite approach here, but in a different way. Uh, again, as um, you were mentioning correctly, the fact that uh, transhumanism embraces it through the tradition of the Enlightenment, and again, it's not just saying that, is uh, stated in the first transhumanist declaration, 1994-1988. Uh, so that was again written in the history of the movement that their own genealogy comes out of the Enlightenment. In this sense, again, technology comes of this notion of progress, it's linear, and again goes to what are our current technology or also uh, potential technologies, for instance, cryonics. We don't know if it's going to work, but we hope it's going to. And that's a way to think of technology, but as a posthumanist, that's a limited way of thinking of technology. Everything is technological. Humans themselves are technological beings. That's why we are here. According to paleontology, humans are those animals that create technology out of technology, a tool out of a tool. So other, other animals can create tools, but humans are among the few, because again, there are some other primates that can create tools out of tools. So again, technology is already strictly connected to the notion of the human. And here again, we embrace technology in a much wider way through the reflection that Heidegger um, started with a question concerning technology, 1953, about seeing technology as a way of revealing. So I really love your question. Definitely a very, very beautiful and deep question. The difference between upgrading is that you are taking for granted what you have and you're going to upgrade what you have. You don't deconstruct it. You, you don't have a problem with that. As a posthumanist, I don't upgrade what I have because already what I have, I deconstruct. It's a constant movement of reflection of what I have already. What I have already, it's not neutral. It's not uh, all inclusive because again, the human has been already ex excluding so many, so many humans. Think of the history of racism. Think of the history of sexism, of classism, homophobia, ageism, you name it. Mm -hmm. There is so much of that ageism. Um, and this is constant. It's not just in a one point in history where the kind of problem is constantly repeating itself. That's why I'm now addressing the problem of dualism. I don't address just uh, racism or just sexism or just classism. Uh, that's not enough because there is always going to be some type of discrimination that some beings are going to have against others. So I think the problem here is dualism, seeing yourself in separation from others. That's why, again, I like your word that you're also connected to a lot of uh, uh, indigenous uh, uh, spiritual traditions uh, in which, again, there is no separation between the notion of the self and the notion of the others. The self becomes this universal or multiversal self in which we are constantly connecting. That's for me, it's very important. And in this sense, technology can give us a very good lesson if we want to learn that, uh, but it can also become dualistic. And next thing we know, we are now trying to uh, think of uh, uh, computers and as uh, the, the, the others. Eh? So, or AI take over, so they become smarter than us and kill us all, or we are going to be stay the master and destroy them all. I'm out of this dualistic way of thinking because I don't believe in that anymore. I don't think it's successful. And that's why I think that upgrading what our, we already have is not what I am envisioning for our futures. And our, I mean, just in the futures in which I can see myself in. I, I resonate with what you're saying. I truly believe um, that um, technology is here to reveal consciousness, not to upgrade the human. I love that. Yeah, I, I'm on the same page on that. And I think that's extremely exciting. I think that technology is revealing a lot about existence in a specific way and is going to do it more so. And I think that instead of just now otherizing this way of consciousness to manifest, it should be the other way, embracing with it, dancing with it, performing with it, creating with it. Some humans are doing that. But definitely this idea, you know, of technology in separation from us, against us, that's a very dangerous path. I'm really not interested in that. I know already that uh, type of path. It leads to war. It leads to very old habits that have not always been there. I don't believe that war has always been with a the human. There are obvious uh, examples that humans have not always been at war. But once you learn some bad habits, it's kind of easy to go back to those. So instead of for me to go back to those old habits, I, write, uh, I rather envision 
other habits, maybe habits that were already there uh, with the humans, even before we can remember, because we are the species that is constantly in amnesia. We constantly forget where we come from. Uh, we can't even remember the first year, year of our life. Some people do. I mean, some guru, uh, Paramahansa Yogananda, he claimed that he could remember being inside of the womb. So some humans can, but in general, we forget constantly. So I think that um, my aim is not repeating these uh, practices that I don't find successful, you know, these dualistic practices of us against them, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, this against the other, uh, you know, the foe and the enemy. I'm really tired of all of that. I don't, see, I don't say that it's wrong or right. I just don't believe in that anymore. And I'm moving on to other things, something, some other dynamics. Wonderful. So from a, a post-humanist perspective, um, how do you look at um, the technologies or the movement of uh, super longevity, extending li human lifespan? You know, the, the health span uh, is absolutely, we want to uh, have human beings live really healthful, vibrant lives. But extending lifespan beyond 100 years old, plus, plus, what's the post-human um, view on that? Yeah, so in this sense, I would like to answer as myself as a posthuman philosopher, but I'm not answering for all the posthumanist philosophers out, out there because there are uh, many different uh, vision of these and uh, many different approaches. I, so I can just mm, locate myself in this discussion and I'm going to uh, say what I think of this. Uh, so I'm not talking for a movement in this moment. Uh, I think that it's inevitable and in this inevitability, I don't see a plus or a minus. I think that we've been constantly moving in that direction. If we think of the romance and normal life would be 30 uh, 30 year years. And then if you become, if you were 50, you were considered super old, super wise, good for you. I mean, not many people would get to that age. And that was not so much, not, not too much uh, time ago. Um, so that, that has been constantly been the case. Humans have constantly been achieving, uh, wanted to achieve more life. I mean, they, 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 they you know, like the, the history of uh, uh, the search for immortality is as old as we can think of the human. So I think even Gilgamesh, one of the first mythologies, not the first one, the first one has a female hero. So that's why we never studied that, which is a beautiful uh, mythology. All of you listening right now, go and read The, the Descents of Inanna. It's a wonderful mythology. The first one we have with a female hero. It's a goddess, the triple goddess, the trinity, uh, very short and very beautiful. Uh, but we do not study because it doesn't go with a patriarchal uh, mindset. So we don't, uh, uh, it doesn't go in the story that we study, in the history that we study. But it's really beautiful and really advise you, you all to read it. It's fantastic. But, you know, one of the first mythologies, it's uh, Gilgamesh. And Gilgamesh, what he does is search for immortality. So that's very old and a very old wish of humans. So I don't particularly have um, a good or bad feelings about it. I do think that uh, um, I do think that we are already mortal in the sense that we are constantly evolving. Uh, who I was when I was uh, one year old is not anymore who I am now. And I do think, and in this, I re really like the transhumanist approach to death. The death is not a moment, it's a process. And also, if you think of Tibetan Book of the Dead, that's what they talk about. Uh, they actually talk about one month and I think one week, more or less, in which there is a, a transformation, a transition uh, uh, in a specific, uh, the Sipa Bardo. So I think that uh, we are Again, think of the sea. I think it gave us a good idea. A wave. We are each of us is a wave that is constantly transforming, and that is part of the transformation that is that has been going on since we were in the womb. Like we've been constantly something else. So I personally not not interested myself in in having to extend my life in in an unlimited way, um, because again I think that each moment is uh, the moment of creation. So each moment is uh, uh, is uh, we are entering in each moment the infinite potential. But I I don't I'm not against it. I think that for some people maybe they need more time. So you know good for them. The thing is that sometimes when you have too much time, then you just procrastinate. And uh, so sometimes it's like Heidegger say uh, that is the most uh, precious gift we have because because we are going to die, we should be authentic in our life. We know that we are going to die. And this is something that I've always been using also in my life, like what I would do if I uh, thought that I would die tomorrow. And then I always try to do everything that it was really meaningful to me because I knew that I didn't have unlimited time. So I think that death can be a gift in order to achieve what we want. But, you know, for some people, if they feel that they need more time, good for them, they should have more time. Although 
the risk of that is that once you have unlimited time that you're just always going to procrastinate and pretty much waste your time. So sometimes even writing as a book, you know, like it's good to have a deadline because if you don't have a deadline, then you're just going on forever. And the deadline, the word deadline, <laughs> I think it's very good in this context of talking about that. So, um, yeah, so I think that that can be a gift. Of course, if it comes too soon or uh, unexpectedly or something like that, it might not be the gift we are looking for. But I think that in my case specifically, having you know, like knowing that I'm not going to be here forever. It's good to push me to do what I want, to be authentic to myself, to go to Heidegger. And Heidegger obviously was a Nietzschean scholar. He, he you know, got to the Nietzsche, the other human. So being that the work of art that you want to be. And to me, those philosophers, Nietzsche, when I was very young and later on uh, feminism and later on posthumanism, and later on Heidegger in its own way, really influenced my life. That's also why I'm a, I'm a, a philosopher right now. So again, for me, the idea that um, you may not live forever, it was useful to push me to do exactly what they want, nothing more and nothing less. Being authentic, see yourself in the mirror, look at those eyes. What do you want to do? Yes, even if you were given an extra 50 years, as Max Moore uh, states often, you know, it will take hyper agency. And I'm starting to see this in women's lives uh, in the last five years, I'm witnessing women um, really, really stepping into what in the, in that in the circle of um, of um, professional, corporate, business, entrepreneurial women is called self authority and is called sovereignty. They're really stepping out of the victim mindset that women have been carrying. Certainly men too. We all humans are kind of touched by victimhood. Um, the, the self loathing, you know, psychology that we come in with after we've been hurt time and time again or abandoned or, you know, we failed. I mean, normal human life. But what we're stepping into is kind of rising past that uh, victim frequency and stepping into sovereignty, self-authority, and Max Moore calls that hyper-agency that's really required to face uh, super, um, to face super longevity, a long lifespan, an explosion of responsibility. So from a post-human um, perspective, or even just from your um, experience of speaking with these incredible colleagues and you guys kind of hashing out what will it take uh, for humanity, for the human psychology to handle even a 150 year lifespan, let's say. Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, thank you for the question also, because it connects to something very practical. If uh, some of you listening now, hi, everyone, by the way, are based in New York. We're actually having the conference Posthuman Ethics at NYU on April 27 and the 28th. It's free, but you do need to register. Uh, and the registration is now open. It's closed on the 25th, uh, first come, first serve. So definitely, um, this is a conversation that is happening. There are going to be scholars coming from different countries of the world. Kevin Warwick is going to be one of our keynote speakers. He's considered the first human cyborg, the first human to insert a microchip in his nervous system. We are going back to 2001. And then the other um, keynote is Rosie Bredotti. She is a really incredible thinker and one of the main voices of the posthuman approach uh, with the book, uh, The Posthuman 2013. So definitely invite you all to to join us um, and um, to be part of the conversation. So going back again to your important question is, uh, um, what do you need in order to live 150 years? That's a great question. Also, I, li I like the connection to Max. I had the, the, um, the beautiful opportunity to be on uh, with, with Max on, uh, on a panel. That was 2013, it was in San Francisco at the APA, the Philosophical Association of uh, America. And um, he, we were talking about cryonics, and uh, and he was made to be uh, cryonics at some level. He was so excited about it. He had so much energy, and um, there was not a little, uh, not a shade of fear about death uh, in his approach to cryonics. So after meeting him, I. I changed it to my mind about cryonics because until then, 2013, five years ago, I thought that a lot of people would be uh, would like to be cryonized because of fear of death. Mm? I know that it's not for everyone, but the people that I talked to, I also was uh, on a panel with uh, um, uh, records well in 
2012. And again, from my feeling <coughs> of some people before meeting Max, I had the feeling might be, you know, might have not been totally accurate, but some people definitely would have been like to be cryonized because um, of fear of death and, and maybe to answer to that kind of uh, anxiety about what happened after. After I met him, it was different. After I met him, I realized that some few people want to be cryonized because they're excited about the future. And it was so beautiful, you know, it was an excitement for me. It was like, okay, it doesn't have to be based on fear, it can be based on excitement. So I can totally see Max uh, working on uh, the project. What do you need to live 150 50 years with full energy? Because that's what he wants to do. I mean, he probably wants to live more than 150 years. I think they're talking now about 800 years. Uh, that's kind of the radical span, um, lifespan uh, goal uh, of the transhumans will be 800 years. But yeah, the first one, easy to achieve, I would say 150. Definitely, I think there is not, there are not going to be too many problems with that. So what do you need? I think you probably need some good uh, guidelines and education when you start your life because you will need a totally different approach. Uh, you, you will need to focus on the Ubermensch on some level on Nietzsche, on following your own, uh, your own vision. Uh, it will be not enough just to have a job because at the point you will have to think of probably at least 10 different jobs in a, in a lifestyle, in a lifespan. I mean, definitely you're not going to do the same job for 150 years without getting bored. People get bored already now after two years of doing the same thing. So you're not going to do that for 150 years. So you definitely need to really think of yourself as creating this art project that is your life from early on, um, and that's why we need to think in combination of, of uh, um, you know, the topic of, uh, uh, of uh, radical life extension with education, social system, uh, all these uh, resources. So we really need to think uh, in parallel. We cannot think of one in separation from uh, other aspects, but these are all combined. Uh, that's why the posthuman field is transdisciplinary. So you cannot just focus on on science, on uh, nanotechnology in separation from resources or from uh, the social system or from uh, health and education. So in that sense, I think that uh, it would be a revisiting the notion of existing in this planet together because we are alone, we are born and, and, and die alone, but we are together. We cannot survive without others. We need, to, we, we need food to survive, we need air to survive, we need others to procreate if that's something that people are interested, they might not be, but we need others to talk to. Mm? So we're always, we need others in order to survive, to thrive. Um, so again, uh, going back to your point, we need to rethink of what it means to be uh, to be to existing. I, I don't necessarily to say human, but to exist as a being in this planet in the 21st century uh, with a lifespan that is not anymore uh, 80 years, but can be 150, can be 200, can be 400, and could actually become 800, 1000. Yeah, it's it's absolutely uh, ahead of us. Um, uh, what Ray Kurzweil, um, Kurzweil um, said regarding the morality of the future human, uh, he's very positive about it, that in fact there's not going to be a, a fight over transhuman uh, technologies because ultimately once we reach there within 30, 40, 50 years, by then humanity will have evolved towards a human that will have such an expansive sense of morality towards others. And what I love about what you said in one of your talks, I wrote it down even because you noted that ultimately down the road, the self is the others within. Yeah. That's, yeah. The, that's the future human. Tell us more about what you mean by that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, uh, that's, um, thank you so much for uh, bringing that uh, thought in the conversation. Yeah, this is something that uh, I think it's, uh, it's an important point to really think in post dualistic ways. Um, in this uh, close future, in this future that is already happening, um, I do see what Ray is talking about. But I also do see that um, humans are not all treated under the same level of humanity. And in this sense, you know, think of the refugee crisis, think of uh, some humans who don't even have access to, to food or to water. So definitely, again, I think that it's really 
harder to, to separate the social issues from the technological advancement. We should really think in connection because we, like you said, are all connected. We are already the others. So the, what do we mean by that? On some level, we can think of the tradition of uh, spiritual traditions. We can think of the enlightened tradition in which once you realize who you are, you realize that you are everything. Think of quantum physics. Think of the fact that everything is constantly connecting with, you know, even on a material level, on a material level. So again, from, from, a, a, from a very scientific perspective, I think quantum physics, it's a, it's a very good uh, way to try to understand what we mean by we are the others. On the other way, biology, think of all the bacteria that are uh, inside of us and thanks to which we are healthy. We need those bacteria inside of our digestive system. So when we think from, from our body, our body is, is already universe. So we can already think of the multiverse, which is already happening on the cosmic level, but we cannot even think of that from a biological perspective of bodies within bodies, within bodies, within bodies. So in this sense, again, it is important to really think of us in this constant, as constant uh, bridge, bridges that are constantly opening new possibilities. Uh, so in this sense, we are others, we are with others, we are the others, the self as the others within. Uh, we are also part of a species. We share 99% of, of our DNA, not 100%. Every human is different, but we do share a lot. We do share a lot in the history of biological consciousness. We are affecting the others. Um, we are on some, we can tap on some level according to the tradition of psychoanalysis to the, to the collective unconscious. Uh, and for instance, thinking of Jung. So again, it's, um, if I am, uh, if I have everything I want, and it's like the Buddha, uh, the, when before he was a Buddha, Siddhartha, he had everything he could imagine. He was in this perfect castle. Everything was perfect. He anything he could dream of would be materialized in front of him. There was no death. There was no sick. There was just beauty and dance and poetry and sensuality. But then, at one point, he opened the doors and he goes out and he realizes someone is dying. Someone is sick. Someone is being uh, abused. And he realized that he to be fully completed enlightenment, enlightened, he could not be just inside of his own vision, which is important to have. That's why he was able to go out and be strong because he realized in his youth that he could be loved, that he could love, that he could manifest his dreams. But then when he comes out and realized that a lot of people were not able, he realized that he is everything and everyone can become the Buddha. Uh, so that I think is a beautiful story that teaches a lot also you know, about the, the idea of uh, being connected to the others. Uh, you know, the mystic tradition is not just uh, shelter yourself from others, but being at one point connected to everything, to every, not all, not only humans, but non-humans. Think of uh, St. Francis of Essence. He was talking to the, to the animals. He was communicating with the stars, to the plants. And now we can think of technology and the drones and uh, so again, I think of, again of us, I like, I like the painter Alex Gray in the way he represents reality. It's so beautiful. He connects the human to the non-human, to the plants, to technology, to the dimensional multiverses. So that's all for me. It's really thinking of the self as others as a, a meditation practice that you can endorse every second of your life. That is powerful beautiful just just beautiful philosophy <laughs> thank you thank you so thank much. you do you thank have you a few more this. minutes for us of course i do wonderful i would love to ask you a question about the voices um uh, women's voices in the futures movement um i when i when i came across natasha vita moore's work immediately i ran up to her and i said natasha you know i have four degrees the last thing i need is another degree but I totally would jump into a PhD with you. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, cause I felt like the, this, this, um, the futures dialogue is really, really, um, it's, it's fantastic. It's really growing. Um, but it, truly feels like it is about 90% male voices, which, I mean, there is fantastic female within the male voice as well. But the the place of women uh, in the futures dialogue, can you touch on that since you're right in the middle of it? 
Yeah, well, thank you so much for asking this question. Um, I mentioned previously that actually feminism was one of those philosophies uh, who actually changed my own life. The first one, philosophically talking, was Nietzsche. I had the great uh, luck, actually, I would say luck, to study him when I was 16, and studying the other man really opened my life to the idea of uh, living exactly the, le the life I wanted. Uh, think of the eternal recurrence, the idea that everything can come exactly the same, what you would do in the case. You know, if you think as a metaphor that your life could, could come exactly the same, nothing, nothing different, exactly the same, would you still embrace it? Would you still love your life? And then it's when you really try to create the life you want, because, you know, as a metaphor, if life could come exactly the same, you want to live something you, you enjoy. After that was, uh, so Nietzsche when I was 16, uh, feminism came when I was, uh, I think, 19 year old. I, um, I realized at the point that uh, all the voices of the people who I've been studying until now were all Male. I used to write po poetry, I used to be an author, and I realized I was writing in a male voice because in Italian, I'm originally from Italy, you, when you use the subject, the subject is gendered. So the subject could be female or male or male. And I was, uh, real I didn't realize that I was using constantly a subject that was male. And I realized why, because I only studied until then philosophers who were male, uh, poem poets who were male, um, historians who were like everyone who studied until then were uh, were uh, embodied as a male. So I realized that I, I was having a gap. I was I was missing many voices of humanity. And at the point for two years, I think I tried to only read female authors, female philosophers, female poets, female artists, female, 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 female. Uh, feminism really guided me in uh, in learning more about existence, uh, teaching me a lot, the private is political, uh, really uh, deconstructing a lot of notions that we take for granted. What does it mean to be female? What does it mean to be male? Um, I, you know, at the time, uh, I realized also that these are two static categor categories. A lot of people do not recognize themselves in those. So I saw more the rainbow in, in the whole approach to gender. And um, so feminism is definitely something that uh, I am uh, uh, very... Um, grateful to because it really opened my eyes in so many levels. Also bringing the body back to the conversation uh, in, in this existence, everything is a body. Um, we're, done, we're not necessarily talking about physical bodies, can be virtual, can be, uh, can be um, avatars, but we're still talking about some type of embodiment in order to manifest, and I'm talking about this dimension, maybe some other dimension may be different, the dream world is a different approach, but in this, uh, in this life in which we are connected right now, in which we are having this conversation, you need some type of body in order to manifest. And again, I'm not only talking about physical body or biological bodies. That's why I go beyond biocentrism. Could be a digital body, for instance, could be an avatar. Um, but you still need some type of embodiment. And this is something that even the field of artificial intelligence, which were all based on mind, going to a very specific male tradition, Cartesian tradition of male um, thinking uh, connected to reason, in which you have the body split uh, soul. So you have uh, the body that doesn't count and the soul that counts, or the body that doesn't, doesn't count and the mind that counts. In that tradition, the mind uh, was the, the plus and the body was the minus. That's why artificial intelligence coming out of the tradition can machine think has been really trying to develop the, um, the, the, the reason beyond uh, being artificial. Uh, of course, this has been creating many problems. The fact that artificial intelligence at the moment is stuck on some level is because they were not taking into consideration the, this aspect of the embodiment. This came back at the very beginning of the 21st century uh, with an approach that actually realized that you cannot think of any, any type of being without the embodied aspect. So I think that, uh, that women coming from, uh, from a specific tradition of uh, thinking uh, that is embodied uh, of oral histories, of, of collective consciousness, I think that uh, um, the voice of women have always been there, have always been shaping this society, but not uh, in, a, in, in a way that could affect other um, people who were in, in uh, power um, decisional locations on a, let's say, a explicit way. Let, let me rephrase this because it gets a little convoluted. What I'm saying is that um, I do think that in this dimension, everyone is affecting the whole dimension. Going back to our previous point, uh, even people who didn't have access to a position of power, uh, everyone is uh, already agents in this. 
but um, because some people were uh, prevented uh, to uh, be uh, to have their voices heard by many people, uh, I think that uh, society uh, has been focusing on values that come from a specific tradition that have, uh, has self-created uh, its own values. That what is what I'm saying is that, for instance, if you look at the history of humanity, if you look at the history of uh, sexism and racism, just to bring to the conversation two examples out of many, we see that uh, most people that we study in, in, in history, most people that are in power now, most people that have uh, decide about other people's lives have been male and have been white. Now, this is a generalization. I'm very aware of that. Uh, and I'm not saying that all the other people didn't have agency in the, uh, in the um, manifestation of the dimension. But I also think that that voice, uh, I won't point to cover, uh, has been heard by many. And now it's the time for many other voices to come in. Uh, and that's, again, that's evolution evolution of consciousness. So we study patriarchy. Before patriarchy, there is a huge chapter, which was uh, the prehistory, which we never study, which was very much uh, based on matrilineal um, symbolism. That's why God was represented as a female and was the goddess. 99 or 90, yeah, 99 percent of the figurines that we found in prehistory and talking about Paleolithic and Neolithic are female. So all that uh, huge chapter, which is, uh, we're talking about uh, hundreds of thousands of years is was more based on a female symbolism but we don't study that because it doesn't go together with the uh, symbolism characterizing our era which was was which was patriarchal but now we are seeing a shift we're seeing a shift and i think the next symbolic era is going to be probably a, a cyborgian symbolism not female anymore not male anymore it's going to be cyborgian in the sense that it's not going to be based on an essentialist approach to what is a female what is a male and i think again technology is going to be part of that and i think also some of the religious symbolism is going to be connected to technology so fi to finalize the answer to your important question i think that uh, women um, and all uh, the connection to the history of gender in relation to the feminine history uh, is going to um, is going to evolve in different ways that are um, probably um, uh, th thriving outside of a dualistic approach to female and male. I think this is the um, paradigm shift which is starting now and it is going to develop into a new chapter. It's going to be better or worse, who knows? We're not going to be there. It's outside of good and bad going back to Nietzsche, but definitely that's what's happening. It's a transformation. Patriarchy is, is dead. Again, I'm sorry for, for the people who, uh, who wish it was still going on. It's, it's, it's dying, let's say it's dying. But it's definitely kind of uh, moving towards something else. And the something else, I think, is going to go beyond female and male. I think it's going to be more into like the, the spectrum of colors, you know, the rainbow, the, the pluralistic, the plurilog, instead of a, the monologue, which was patriarchal, or even the dialogue, which might have been matriarchal. I think we're going to go into more of a plurilog. Mm, interesting, because I, I see it as, you know, the, the yin and yang, the, the feminine, the masculine, the expansion and contraction exist in this time and space of evolution because um, we are um, still in a dualistic um, time of our evolution. And as that, as that evolves, you're, we're moving more and more towards um, frequency of one. But you're actually saying that we're actually differentiated, differentiating into a multicolored rainbow. That's interesting. You, yeah, you talk about the evolution moving towards differentiation, and that would be probably not how I've been viewing it. I see it as moving towards the one. Can you touch on that? I'd yeah, love to... yeah. No, that's a great question. Is actually uh, we're entering now in ontology. So for the people who are listening and might not have a very clear, like a, a philosophical dictionary, ontology is the discourse, logos, logi, logos on what is ontos from ancient Greek. So now um, Denisa and I are entering the realm of ontology. What is? And according to Denisa, um, we are talking about monism, which is again going 
the connection of to one. And, and rightly enough, uh, Denise was saying that I told, bring the pluralistic approach. Now, Denise, going to your question, I just uh, wanted to summarize a little because we are really getting to beautiful, I love the ontological discussion because I'm an ontological thinker, but I wanted to clarify. Yes, you're right. I do bring the, uh, the, 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 the diversification in the process of evolution, but what I call it is a pluralistic monism or a monistic pluralism at the same time. So I don't only talk of pluralism separated from monism, and I'm not only talking of mon monism in separation from pluralism. Let's go back to an example that we brought before. Let's think of say, us, our body, who we are. Now, if we think of the bacteria again, uh, and I'm not being tri trivial in this, I'm being very uh, serious in, in a beautiful way of the multiverse that we are with other entities, with other organisms. Now, those bacteria that are in our guts, that we don't think of as us necessarily, but they allow us to survive. Like they are good for us. They, they keep balance and health in our own body. Now, in that sense, we can think again of us already, who we are as a multiverse. But there is, there is also oneness. So I can think of myself, my body as many bodies. Think again of this organism in myself, but it's one. So it's one and it's many at the same time. Mm? So in this sense, that's why I never just write pluralistic monism. I always add or monistic pluralism because I don't see an order of importance there. I don't think that the many comes before the one or the one comes before many, but the, I, the, I, they are not the same, but they are completely uh, related. Um, so again, it's, um, the notion of sameness is problematic. I would, uh, I would kind of like go beyond the notion of sameness. Uh, you can think on some level of panentheism if you are entering, entering the discourse, the theistic discourse, the discourse on God, when uh, instead of pantheism, so it's not that just God is everything that we can think of, of everything that is, it also be beyond anything that we can experience, but it's still connecting. And again, I'm not using God in a religious sense, but God as a philosophical notion or God as, as you know, like the notion of uh, interconnection of, of everything. So going back to your point, uh, for instance, in, in this sense, I, um, I take a different approach to, Mon, uh, to Rosie. Rosie Berdotti, she's a monistic thinker, although coming from Spinoza, it's already differen differential monism. But in my case, I don't use just monism, which would be more what you were underlined, which I think it's, uh, there is definitely truth in monism, but it's not the whole picture. Like you and me and, um, and Anita, which say hi, Anita Teresa, we're a common friend and, uh, and many other people. We're all part of a species, but this species cannot be, be defined just as one of us. So in the sense, again, think of the human species, think of these, or think of ants, uh, the ants, when they come in your house, it's like, oh my God, all of a sudden there is like hundreds of ants and they all move perfectly in a line. This is Deleuze, talks a lot about the ants, uh, about insects, the way they move. So on some level, they move like many, but then something f f fall on the group of ants and boom, they scatter all over and we realize there are thousands and from far away, look one. So this is what I'm talking about. The one is not separated from the many and the many is not separated from one. So if we think only of one, it's problematic because then we go into the universalistic tradition. For instance, the declaration of human rights, they should apply to everyone and then use only a male term to use terms like brotherhood, completely excluding half of the story, like sisterhood, for instance, and then trying to apply these, uh, um, these values to maybe people who do not believe in that. So again, the problem of the universalistic approach is when I think that I can talk for everyone, but I cannot because everyone can come from different perspectives, a Nietzsche perspectivism, everyone is situated in a specific location in this existence. So more than talking for everyone, again, bringing back the notion of the plurilog, being in the, in a multilog with everyone else, not one voice, like, like a chorus. When so many voices come together and there are many different voices, but then they can sing one thing together. So I think maybe the chorus, which is also beautiful, go back to the Korah, again, ancient Greek. Uh, it's a nice, uh, it's a nice notion for help, for us to help the idea of plural, pluralistic monism or monistic pluralism. Yeah, that, that resonates. Yes. You, you, you put me in the right place. <laughs> um, I just want to touch on something you, um, you touched on in your TED talk about, um, ancient futures. Um, 
ancient uh, technologies uh, that take us to non-ordinary non states of consciousness. Um, why did you bring that in? That was just so fascinating. I thought, oh goodness, this is a neo woman. Um, <laughs> touch on um, touch on the ceremonial shamanic non-ordinary states of consciousness and how they inform the future. Yeah. So again, I come from a tradition in which time is not linear. So it's not that yesterday is gone and uh, and today is what we're experiencing and tomorrow is not here yet. I come from a tradition that you can think of uh, um, of uh, the yugas in the ancient Hindu tradition. You can think of Nietzsche. Um, you can think of ancient society in which time was, co and still now, all the indigenous society in which time is considered more of a cycle. In all of these, I like to think of time as a spiral more than a cycle. Uh, all cycle, again, yes, through the indigenous traditions, uh, for instance, the season. Uh, we are entering now the spring. Uh, last year, there was a spring, which was connected to the spring, but it was a different spring. Mm? So again, a spiral. We have cycles that keep coming back, but in a spiralistic way, in the sense they are not exactly the same, so a little different from Nietzsche in this sense. Uh, so in this tradition, again, the future is not something that is not here yet. It is already here. You can have memories of the future on some level. Of course, although we are in constant potential. So of course, you can constantly also altered this, uh, this uh, uh, rhythmic uh, tradition of time. You can, um, I can think also um, of, uh, of space time because the time is not separated from space, from the physics tradition. I can think of space time as a material entity that holds memory. In this memory, the more us as a species, us as individuals do something, the easier we are going to do the same thing. Uh, including habits that we might want to, uh, to, uh, not to repeat. Uh, they say that, for instance, if you stop doing something for three months, you're going to be less likely to do it. And then six months, even less likely. And then nine months is going to be really much less likely that you're going to get into the same habits. The same goes as a species. Uh, again, the, the idea of war, uh, when I was studying this in history, uh, history at school, they, they made it look like history always been, the, uh, uh, war always been there. But then if you study, uh, actually, interesting enough prehistory uh, before the Neolithic, you realize that it's a whole different story. It's actually war entered with the invasion of borders because all of a sudden this is mine and that is yours. So um, we start habits constantly in our life. Uh, and the habits, you can think of habits connected to ethics too. Ethics come from ethos, ethos um, in ancient Greek, which is exactly what it means habit. Uh, now, a ceremony is a habit. Um, going back to the shamanic tradition, we can be shamans in our, our every daily existence. We can think in of transforming the whole uh, um, space-time uh, dimensional realm to our habits because we are in it. It's almost like you are in uh, in a swimming pool with the water. You are entering, you are moving the water. So it's not that you are neutral. You, you could be there or you couldn't be there. You, if you are not there, it's the same thing. You are there, your body changing the whole system. The water touches you. You are touching the water. You are becoming part of this entity. And we are like that in space-time. It's not that we are separated from space-time. Our habits are constantly affecting space-time, and we are rechanging on some level. Uh, you can think of uh, uh, re, uh, redesigning on some level the whole uh, the whole dimensional realm. So the shamanic tradition absolutely tap into that. They were very aware, and they are still very aware of that. The shamanic traditions are still going on nowadays in, in many countries, including our, our own in the United States. And uh, in the shamanic tradition, I've always been very aware of this complete agency of us as entities, as energetic entities in uh, in in this uh, in this um, in this dimension. In the sense, the shaman is also the um, uh, is also the animal, is also the the non-human, is also the plant, is also the earth, uh, Pachamama. Uh, the idea again that you are not separated from all the other beings that. Once we enter into a, a, a taxonomical society, uh, before biology with taxonomy and tax, I mean category, when we enter into the categorization, then in order to 
categorize, I need to separate, to create borders and more borders and more borders. But the shamanic tradition is kind of going transcending all the borders in the sense that you are already all these uh, elements of existence that you are witnessing. So it's not only that you can see uh, the, the, the plant, that you can uh, see the animal, you are these uh, entities that are manifesting in front of you because you are part of this bigger picture, which is space-time. And again, think of us uh, entering the ocean uh, with a beautiful dive. We are coming into this world, we're manifesting from the Sipa Bardo, going back to the Tibetan tradition, we're manifesting, we become this. But in becoming this, we are completely engaging with everything. We are transforming everything that is manifesting uh, at the same time as us. So again, if we're entering the swimming pool, the water level changes because of our because of uh, of welcoming our body. Um, the, the movement of the waves are changing because of, of us. Uh, so again, the shamanic tradition were completely aware of all these aspects since uh, the very beginning. So much the very beginning that we have already um, uh, um, we can already witness uh, uh, shamanic practices in the Paleolithic uh, um, tradition. So we can Im uh, there are images of shamanic at first. They thought they were male shamans, and other thinking they were actually female shamans in caves in uh, in old Europe. Um, so again, a very ancient tradition that come with the notion that on some level humans have always been posthuman, and that's what, something I want to underline. I don't see the posthuman that is just related to us now. I think it's something that is can be also traced back to uh, to the history of the human, to the prehistory of the human before we were human. Uh, so it's a kind of the transition is before you were human and after you, you were a human in a tradition where, it, again, time is not linear. Beautiful. Oh, you know, I could talk to you forever. <laughs> Me too, Denise. <laughs> but I'm going to let you go so you can have an evening. But please, let's continue this conversation for the rest of time, okay? I would love that. I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. Technology is going to reveal us. And with beautiful, beautiful expert souls uh, like yourself, we're going to uh, steer this in a really... Um, benevolent direction as much as is in our powers. Teresa, thank you so much for allowing us to th to think together about these topics, because again, I don't see the tradition of thought separated from from what's happening to, to the praxis, that theory and practice are not separated. So I do fully, completely believe in the fact that what we are doing is meaningful, is changing, uh, is, 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 is connecting with others. And uh, thanks so much for, uh, for allowing this conversation to happen tonight. It was beautiful and memorable and, uh, and much more to come. Much more to come. Grazie, Bella. Thank Grazie you. Grazie. <laughs> Tanti much, uh, much, much love. And we will resume this conversation in New York. How about that? Absolutely. And have a wonderful time in, uh, in Costa Rica. Actually, I am alive because of Costa Rica. So please bring uh, my gratitude to Costa Rica. I was living in Central America, having a wonderful time. I got malaria and I got it in Nicaragua. So the system there, it was not the best at the time. And I would have pretty much died if I didn't have the luck of having another malaria attack in Costa Rica. And they completely took care of me, everything, like they, they, they healed me. Um, and I'm alive because of Costa Rica. So please bring my my full gratitude to the country. I want to go back and, and, and do, you know, like, and, and live there for some time as well. I have a lot of gratitude and love towards Costa Rica. So please, please do. Well, let's create a beautiful retreat there together. What do you say? Why not? Yeah. That would be fantastic. <laughs> All arrange <Yeah>. it. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, it's the Garden of Eden. Sign me up for your uh, end of April um, philosophy uh, conference. And oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I yeah, will be in, there. Of course. Mm -hmm. oh, that would be excellent. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, let's talk once. What, what yeah. We'll, uh, I will get in touch with you before, um, before. I'll, as soon as I get to Costa Rica, I'll arrange things and um, I'll um, I'll get back to you. But oh my goodness, yes, this is only the beginning. Grazie, Bella. <laughs> thank, right, thank you so much. Love and, much and love. visions and philosophy and everything. Thank you so much, Denise. Thank you so much.